our guest today is the Attorney General for the state of Illinois. Prior to being elected to Attorney General, he served as a Democratic member of the Illinois Senate. Our guest today was appointed to fill the seat vacated by then-Senator Barack Obama upon Obama's election to the United States Senate. Um, I'm also going to add here, I love his line when someone said, well, what are you going to do? You have big shoes to fill. And he said, I got my own shoes. And that was a tagline for him. And it's been ever so true. If you know the Attorney General at all, um, stands on his own two feet, makes his own decisions. And I know that sounds biased for me, but that's just the truth. He earned his bachelor's degree in political science from DePaul University and his law degree from Chicago Kent. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you our Attorney General, Mr. Kwame Raoul. Well, good afternoon. I'm glad that I didn't get confused and go to Maggiano's today instead of. <laughs> um, I want to, uh, I know Jackie fast forwarded through things because I do, I want to forewarn you that I, I do have an important call w along with my uh, colleagues from throughout the country early this afternoon. So. Um, to the members of the media, I'm not running away from you, but this is a very uh, important call. Uh, interacting with attorneys general from throughout the countries uh, happening frequently for me, and as, as I will talk uh, about in just a moment. But as I mentioned, other attorneys general, I want to recognize Attorney General Roland Burris, who, by the way, I've known since I was in the second grade. <laughs> You know, I know many of you all uh, in the room were planning to hear from me in July. I apologize to you all, but unfortunately I was called to Florida to be with my mother, who made a transition just a few days later. I do appreciate the support and the kindness of some of you who are here. But I'm grateful to have had my mother with me during the past year, which has been one of the best years of my life, personally and professionally. My mother was with me on November 6th of last year, the 15th anniversary of my father's death, when she surprised me after having not traveled for uh, over a decade, she surprised me and traveled to Chicago to witness me being elected this state's 42nd Attorney General. She also summoned the strength in July to be with me on one of the most important days of my life, uh, the day that uh, I got married. She was there after having been, been released from the hospital the day before to home hospice care. I should acknowledge my lovely wife, Dr. Lisa Moore, I've got to explain, had I not done that, which you have to understand, uh, I've got to go to sleep at night, and I did just marry an anesthesiologist in July. <laughs> Every day, I try to embody mom's strength and her spirit of caring for others as I serve as your attorney general. I ran for attorney general knowing that there has perhaps never been a time in our nation's history where the role of state attorney general has been more important than it is right now. Today, I will share with you how state AGs are stepping up in an unprecedented manner against corporations acting in ways inconsistent with the public interest, in instances where the Department of Justice decided to take a step back, or in cases where the federal government has decided to implement unlawful policies. 
I will also share how we have worked within state to protect the people of the state of Illinois. Since I took the oath of office in January, I've met regularly with my counterparts from throughout the nation. We perceive the urgency of this moment and the ways in which we are uniquely situated to defend the rights and interests of our respective states. So we've convened frequently to discuss best practices, collaborate on multi-state litigation and policy efforts, and learn from each other's successes, and also learn from where we may have fallen short. As a legislator, I've developed a reputation over 14 years of having been able to work with folks from the other side of the aisle. I do the same as Attorney General, notwithstanding profound ideological disagreements I have with some of them. As a son of a community physician and as a cancer survivor, I will fight Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton to the last breath in my body to defend access to health care and coverage for pre-existing conditions. But I'm not attacking Ken, right? You know? He and I have had an, an opportunity to break bread over shared challenges with opioid abuse, and of course what all of you all hate are those robocalls. <laughs> the same is true with Doug Peterson of Nebraska, Bridget Hill in Wyoming, and many other of my counterparts from across partisan lines. No matter what our political persuasion, we can all align against those obnoxious robocalls that take advantage of the vulnerable. That's why we teamed up with the Federal Trade Commission and 13 other states to launch Operation Call It Quits to put an end to those universally loathed phone calls. Also, along with most of the nation's attorney generals, attorneys general, 43 of us in all. I filed suit against 19 of America's largest generic drug manufacturers to stop what we believe is a broad conspiracy to inflate and manipulate prices. We can all agree that, it, that that is wrong, no matter what side of partisan lines we are. We can also agree that pharmaceutical companies should be held accountable for the irresponsible marketing of opioids in their role in an epidemic of addiction that claims lives of 130 Americans every day, and six here in the state of Illinois every day. Since I took office, we filed suit against multiple opioid manufacturers and distributors who have flooded the market with addictive and insufficiently monitored prescription opioid based drugs. And we have directly sued the Sackler family, owners of Purdue Pharma. I continue to reject, in the strongest terms, any settlement or agreement with Purdue that does not hold the Sackler family adequately accountable for the irreparable harm their actions have caused to families in Illinois and throughout the country. While bipartisan collaboration has made possible by the, is made possible by the enormity of the challenges our respective states face, many of the multi-state efforts in which my office is involved have been driven by the current leadership in Washington. Yes, Donald Trump. <laughs> when the actions of the federal government threaten the people of, of the state of Illinois and the rule of law in general, it is my duty to work with those attorney generals, attorneys general, I always mess up the, uh, <laughs> who are like-minded and stand against these threats against the rule of law. 
whether it's defending the rights of asylum seekers, fighting for access to reproductive health care, protecting the in integrity of the census, or safeguarding our air, water, and endangered species, we have stood firm alongside other states that share our interests and our values. I'm also aware that it's not enough to just join in with other states. It's important for us as Illinois to exercise leadership in many of these efforts, befitting our demographic and our economic position. Often the strength of a state's connection to the underlying cause of action drives decisions about which state will lead a, as lead plaintiff. But whenever possible, Illinois has taken the lead on such efforts as an amicus brief in the LGBT employment discrimination cases in which the US Supreme Court has just heard arguments, a comment letter opposing changes to the federal poverty threshold that could ex exclude millions of low-income Americans from benefits, and a multi-state letter objecting to the new rule that would deny equal access to homeless shelters for trans and gender non-conforming individuals. Illinois is leading. And often, our day-to-day -day work defending our states and their people intersects with what is happening on the national level. One example of how this national fight comes to our own backyard is the environment. I've joined with attorneys general, got it right that time, <laughs> to stop the federal government from abdicating its responsibilities to both set and enforce environmental standards. Whether it's stopping the federal government from abandoning the Clean Power Plan or defending the rights of states to set their own vehicle emissions caps, these national actions serve as an important reminder that environmental issues don't stop at our state lines. Here in Illinois, the failure of the federal government to protect our environment has manifested itself in the regulation of ethylon, ethylene, uh, ethylene oxide emissions. That wasn't even the word attorneys general. <laughs> Sterigenics has closed its plant in Willowbrook. And that's thanks to sustained co commitment of community activists, state action that closed the plant for months, and legislative action setting the strictest ETO emission standards in the country. But our fight to ensure no community experiences dangerous levels of ETO emissions is not over. While affirmative litigation is a useful tool to advance environmental protection, let us accept that it, 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 it is not limitless. What we cannot achieve through litigation, we must seek through collective advocacy. And it cannot be the sort of NIMBY advocacy that ignores pollution in disadvantaged communities. That's why our office, joined by 15 others, other attorneys general, penned a letter to the federal EPA urging the agency to enact stricter ETO emission standards and, and to work with the FDA to expedite research into alternative methods of sterilizing medical equipment that saves lives. Another unfortunate national fight that has become local is the scourge of vaping. In just a few short years, we've gone from celebrating historic declines in youth cigarette smoking to watching in alarm as youth e-cigarette usage increased by 78%. The rate of e-cigarette usage by Illinois high school students has now surpassed the combustible 
cigarette smoking rate of Illinois adults. As characterized by the child of a colleague in law enforcement, it's awfully convenient for students that high schools put toilets and urinals in the vaping room. Our office has warned the public, particularly teens, against the dangers of vaping in the wake of serious illness and even deaths of e-cigarette users. We began wide-ranging investigations into the marketing practices of major e-cigarette manufacturers. In the course of this investigation, we are also monitoring vaping products that pass through the black and the gray market. Meanwhile, we've been studying the evidence, looking at what other states are doing, and working with legislators and advocates to determine the best strategies for stopping this public health crisis in its tracks. As we examine state level options, we have joined with other attorneys general in a letter urging the FDA to ban online sale of e-cigarettes and step up enforcement actions against all e-juice flavors, including mint and menthol. We must stop the intentional targeting of children for nicotine addiction. I pause for that applause because, you know, this is a very, very important issue that I'm passionate about. Because I'm a father. And as a father, I, I take especially seriously the role of the Attorney General in protecting children. Sadly, we cannot assume our children are safe in any setting. And that's something I cannot accept as a new normal. We shouldn't simply adjust to a new reality that there are places, whether a school, a church, or online playing games with their friends on your living room sofa, where young people are going to be at risk and don't deserve to be protected. The Attorney General's Office engages in training law enforcement and members of the public. Over 28,000 people in 2018 and 2019 with a focus on helping parents protect their children and teaching youth to protect themselves from online predators. Our, state our statewide Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force collaborates with local and federal law enforcement to take on specialized investigations of Internet predators, including a former resident of Pontiac picked up by U.S. Marshals in Arizona for child pornography. These actions are especially important because 76% of offenders convicted of internet crimes against children admit to being hands-on offenders. Ten months after taking over my predecessor, from my predecessor, the investigation of clergy abuse within the Catholic Church our goal continues to be accountability for both abusers and those who permitted such abuse to occur. Although many allegations cannot have their day in court due to statute of limitations and or the death of the accused, we know that a full public accounting of these heinous breaches of trust is a key part of healing for many survivors. As a result of our investigation, there has been more disclosure from the church. My office will continue to push for a public disclosure of all Catholic clerics who have been credibly accused of sexual abuse against a child. Our hotline has received over 400 calls. 150 of them directly from survivors of cleric abuse. When a survivor requests assistance in approaching the diocese regarding their complaint, we support them in that effort. 
This is a painful but necessary process that is ongoing. And in many cases, it's empowering survivors to share their experiences at review board meetings, meet with bishops, and obtain public disclosure of credible accusations against clergy. We also continue to meet with representatives of the respective dioceses regarding their policies to protect the vulnerable and obtain justice and closure for survivors going forward. In the interest of keeping all Illinois, Illinois residents safe, my office is strengthening our investigative and prosecutorial capabilities. One of my very first hires was a former federal prosecutor who now heads up our criminal law division. She has done an excellent job of enhancing our collaboration with federal law enforcement agencies and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Our attorneys recently secured guilty verdicts in several first-degree murder cases. In one, the defendant was hired by a drug dealer in Danville, in the Danville area, to kill two individuals, which he did. The trial required expert witnesses to testify on firearms, pathology, DNA, fingerprints, and more. Three of our attorneys won a guilty verdict and a life sentence for that per perpetrator. Crimes like these make our communities less safe, and so does gun trafficking, which floods illegal guns into our neighborhoods. I'm proud my office has collaborated with local law enforcement and the ATF to charge two individuals with gun running in March. Again, the role of the state attorney general isn't just to represent the people of the state in court. It also means being an advocate and crafting good legislation and policy. Lisa Madigan once joked with me that she passed more legislation as attorney general than she ever did as a state senator. I'm following her approach. This year, with my active participation, negotiating and visiting some of my old colleagues in the Capitol, we were able to create law to rein in the alternative retail energy suppliers and their deceptive marketing practices. We've probably all been approached with airline miles or a gift card to induce us to switch our electric supplier right away. Never mind this fine print. The HEAT Act requires Aries to fully inform consumers before they make a choice like that, in most cases, that drive up their utility bill. Meanwhile, I've also attended to some of my own unfinished work from when I was in the legislature. Last year, Governor Rauner vetoed a bill that I passed to create a worker protection unit under the Attorney General's office that would have the clear legal authority to bring actions to enforce wage theft and other employment laws. This year, and I want to thank the members of the legislature who are here, the legislation was passed both chambers with bipartisan support, wide bipartisan support, and Governor Pritzker signed it into law. Our unit is up and running and collaborating with the Department of Labor to protect workers in our state. The issue is so important to me that I travel to our nation's capital to testify before Congress about wage theft. As statewide officials, state attorneys general also have a unique opportunity to use their resources in their bully pulpit to marshal creative solutions to systemic problems. That is why I want to tell you about some exciting work we are doing on an initiative that is deeply personal to me. My two ch children are in college now, thankfully. But I raised them in a neighborhood where I had to think about, as a father, how to protect them from gunfire and how to explain gunshots they heard down the block or directly in front of our home. It was truly disturbing to me when my son was 13 to have a conversation with him 
about a 13-year-old boy shot across the street from our home. Too many parents have to have these conversations with their kids. As a public official, I can't ignore it. It's my duty to push back against this normalized violence. We're doing it in three ways. First, you see my little lapel pin here, with the help of Everytown, we're setting up a digital gun tracing platform. This will allow law enforcement across the state to shed a light on multi-county and multi-state trafficking operations and will vastly improve the quality and quantity of our leads. It's a statewide initiative such as one that New York has previously employed. My office, with its, state, with its statewide reach and existing relationships with state and local law enforcement, is ideally positioned to initiate and guide, guide this pro, pro, project to stop the gun trafficking into our neighborhoods. We have demoed the tool for our investigative team and will begin consulting with law enforcement about how they can utilize the platform. Meanwhile, we are also exploring ways to combat gun trafficking through, across state lines through affirmative litigation. Secondly, we seek to facilitate trauma-informed programs. As a legislator, I sponsored a pilot program that opened trauma recovery centers at two hospitals, Advocate Christ in Chicago and Old St. Francis in Peoria. We will advocate for increased access to these types of services. Services that do the difficult and life-changing work of helping individuals recover from trauma or violence, break the cycle, and help build stronger, safer families and communities. Finally, we're expanding the definition of who counts as a victim of crime so that we can interrupt the cycle of violence. The, attorneys general, the Attorney General's Office administers the Crime Victims' Compensation Program, which comes to the aid of victims in their time of need. Historically, unwritten rules meant this program's resources often were not available to victims of gun violence, disproportionately black and brown males. We've been working hard to change that, so our services are more comprehensive, reaching all of survivors of crime who most need our help. We've been removing unnecessary roadblocks, so victims of crime do not become the next perpetrators. Now, I could tell you that there, are all, that there have already been cases where our office is compensating a victim who previously would not, not have uh, received compensation from our office. One individual in particular we assisted worked for a third party, party contractor of Amazon delivering packages. He had been targeted by gangs to solicit pa payment for protection. And when he refused, he was shot in both hands. He subsequently moved, but only five blocks away. In the past, we wouldn't have compensated him for his relocation expenses, because five blocks wasn't far enough away in our calculus. But in this case, five blocks got him out of that gang's territory, and going farther wasn't practical for him. His girlfriend was pregnant, they had family nearby, and he was looking for a new job all while suffering from the trauma of having been shot. I'm proud that we've brought in our perspective to be able to help people like him. I also want to recognize Amazon for their efforts to help this young man out when I brought it to their attention. When I was a juvenile prosecutor, I conducted background checks on minors accused of crime. They often reveal that these minors had been in the building previously on the child protection side, as victims of abuse and neglect, oftentimes in their own home. 
untreated trauma, as I learned back then, takes its toll and often turns victims of violence into perpetrators of the same. Similarly, many perpetrators of gun violence were once victims of the normalized violence that plagues their communities. Our work to expand victim services is our contribution towards breaking that cycle. These purposes are serious. We have created a dedicated violence prevention division in the office, and we're hiring a diverse group of experienced leaders to implement its initiatives. We brought in the Alliance for Safety and Justice, including a survivor of community violence, to address our team. We are working with the state police and federal agencies on best practices for preventing violence in schools. And I recently met with commanders from the Chicago Police Department to explore ways to collaborate with law enforcement to more effectively get resources to crime victims. That's one way we're working to create safe communities for everyone, and it contributes to restoring trust between law, law enforcement and the public. I had an opportunity to meet with Mayor Lightfoot. I'm encouraged by her perspective and her experience. And I think we are aligned in our work together with the implement, implementation of the consent decree with the Chicago Police Department. And in so, as in so many areas, Illinois has the opportunity to emerge as a national leader in police reform. Let me tell you, despite all my preparation to become Attorney General, during the last 10 months, I've learned so much about the vast purview of this office and all the important work it performs for the people of the state of Illinois. This, doesn't, this work just doesn't happen because I direct it. It doesn't happen without 700 dedicated employees of the office. The high level of talent of our staff, both inherited from my predecessor, as well as those I've recruited, continues to astound me. Even though they could easily earn more money in the private sector or at other government agencies who often poach the Attorney General's office, the men and the women in the Attorney's General, Attorney General's office choose to dedicate their time and their talents to making our state a better place. I am humbled to work alongside such dedication, dedicated professionals. It is also the most worthwhile thing I've ever done professionally. There's no shortage of work to be done in order to make our state and our na nation a better place to live. And I'm just getting started. I'd be happy to take questions. That's why we elected him our Attorney General. So, um, just to get the pleasantries out of the way, you know you get your, your, your subscription, you get your mug and all that, okay, that's, gotcha. we got that, but I wanna get to the questions for, he's gonna take it himself, I love it. Okay, so I'm gonna run through these questions, we're not gonna get to all of them, um, get to, we'll get the rest of them to a staff and maybe we can get some answers for you guys. Um, Michael Rapani uh, from Handler Trayer says, what is your office doing to prevent elder abuse in family members and caregivers of the elderly? Thank you, Michael. We continue um, the, the work that um, Lisa Madigan has historically done. We have a uh, hotline that we can take in complaints of elder abuse, and we have a team um, that works both on the prosecution and in other ways to, to protect elders from abuse in their most tender years. Uh, Janice Rogers, are you here, Janice? Oh, only because it's a bigger room, because you know if you're not here, I don't usually ask your, question, ask your question. Janice from Corals and Brady, can you discuss your office's role in the regulation of charities in the state of Illinois? Yeah, so Janice is my old law partner, so she, oh. gets, she gets a pass. <laughs> oh. 
We have a charitable trust bureau that helps, uh, contributes to regulating not-for-profits throughout our state to make sure that they're wor working consistent with their uh, not-for-profit uh, uh, status. Um, that can uh, manifest itself in, in, in a wide variety of ways, but rest assured that uh, uh, we have a vigilant team uh, monitoring those who uh, may maintain that tax exempt status. So I have a question. Is Bob Gallo, are you in the room? Hi, Bob. So um, Bob has a question. With all of the um, investigations and things we have going on, can you talk about how we're going to strengthen the vigilance to ensure fairness with taxpayer rates for several things? This is with regards to utility rates. Well, an FBI investigation has nothing to do with whether or not our office will be vigilant on behalf of ratepayers. Uh, we would do that notwithstanding uh, any such investigation. Uh, my, predecessor, my predecessor was very vigilant at the ICC and, and, and in other forums, including the legislature. I uh, explained how we acted uh, this past session on uh, with regards to ARIES, and we continue to be vigilant at the ICC, and that's not driven by an investigation by the FBI or anybody else. So I have two questions that are literally identical, this, identically the same from Elizabeth Evans and Creola Hampton. The question basically says, when will people who were in prison for marijuana possession be released, and what is being done to help them prepare for reentry from your office's perspective? So our office, um, uh, via the legislation is there, there are several tiers of expungement. Our office um, will be handling uh, the most, the, the least complicated tier of uh, expungement for individuals who have uh, had a history of uh, um, being criminally prosecuted for uh, possession of marijuana. Uh, the overall scheme of uh, reentry, we don't have a reentry function within the Attorney General's office. We uh, do partner just uh, this upcoming Wednesday. We're having a town hall meeting with uh, community advocates, a, a lot of uh, folks who are engaged in such work. Um, but our office directly doesn't engage in, in, in reentry work. We will be engaged in, in some of the expungement. Of, of some of the uh, past marijuana uh, convictions. Our good friend Will Davies from Governor State says, when will we see a day when gun owners would have to register guns like we do vehicles on an annual basis? Do we register annually? Yes, we do. I, I'm a driver. I, yeah, we drive annually. Do we, do, we, do we register annually? What? License plates, okay. License, license plate. uh, I don't think anytime soon, to be honest. Um, listen, I, I, um, I served 14 years in the legislature. I was a proponent and I carried many bills to try to advance gun regulation and, and it was met with obstacles. Uh, we, I, remember, I recall when we tried to limit the number of guns you could purchase every month uh, to 10. Uh, we were unsuccessful, and so uh, if I'm to be honest, uh, I don't anticipate that we'll have an annual registration of, of uh, either concealed carry or, 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 or FOID card or registration of guns. So I've been given the rap sign because I know you've got to be somewhere. Um, I just want um, Michael Rizzo to know that I will make sure that his office gets this question. Uh, I just want to um, ask everyone just to show your appreciation for the Attorney General. The work he does is so important for us all. Thank you. I'll give you a second.